everybody! Welcome to Python lesson number two, which is all about coding software. My name is Maria, and today I'm going to show you two of my most favorite notebook style interfaces that I recommend you guys to use throughout this course. I'll mostly be focusing on Jupyter Notebook, but we'll leave some time for Google Colab towards the end as well. And the reason is, these two interfaces have very, very similar components. So realistically, if you're comfortable with one, you should be able to figure out the other just using your intuition. So let's quickly compare between the two and see what's exactly so special about them. First, Jupyter is a server client application, which is basically a software that runs on your computer while communicating to a remote server. Colab, however, is a cloud service. It is not on your computer's hard drive, it's on Google servers from head to toe. Second of all, Jupyter doesn't need an internet connection to run, while Colab can't even be accessed when you're offline, not to mention running. It's all in a cloud. But on the other hand, it gives you the luxury of not needing to install Python, Anaconda, or any of the packages you'll be using. So it's a blessing and a curse, while Jupyter, on the other hand, will require you to install all of these. The last factor would be the GPU power boost. It is very down the road for us at this point, but it makes a great difference once you get to process enormous amounts of data and you'd like to get your results before the end of the century. So <laughs> Google provides you easy access to GPU from inside your interface, while Jupyter doesn't. So let's dive a little bit deeper and we'll start from Jupyter. So we'll access Jupyter from our Anaconda terminal and if you haven't installed any of these yet, check out lesson number one for instructions. Now we'll just type in Jupyter Notebook and we can press on enter. Now the server pops in our browser and it looks like our Anaconda root folder, which in my case would be C users Maria. So just to demonstrate that we are talking about the exact same location, I'm gonna navigate there um, from my computer. So C users Maria, enter, and you can see that we are talking about the exact same folders. So that way it demonstrates that Jupyter Notebook is on our computer and not on a cloud. So from here, we can navigate anywhere we want and start a new file. Uh, we do this by clicking on new and selecting from two versions of Python. I'm gonna go with Python 3 for our notebook. So the first thing I usually do is I rename the file. So just click on Untitled and you can change it to Coding Software and click on Rename. Now you can add new cells by pressing the plus button and you can execute Python code inside them like so. Uh, let's for instance print something. And before you execute the cell, just make sure you've got code selected in the scroll menu uh, then you can either click on run or you can press shift enter on your keyboard to do so. You can use the arrow buttons to play with the order of cells and even more importantly, you can incorporate headers and paragraphs inside your notebook. And you can do this by changing the type of your cell from code to heading, for instance. And let's uh, correct my typo quickly. And we'll need to run the cell. And as you can see, we've got our header going on. And let's add a paragraph as well. Now, paragraphs are very similar in that way. Um, the only difference is instead of selecting heading, you'll be selecting markdown uh, before executing the cell. Let's run it. And we got ourselves a paragraph. Now, another important detail to notice is you can use HTML code to structureize your cell. Um, and this is an example of a break statement. Perfect, we've got everything we expected. Another important thing is that you can incorporate images. Now images here are not exactly HTML-y. <laughs> you will have to go to edit, um, insert image, and you will have to choose a file on your computer. You can click OK, run the cell, done. Now let's talk a little bit about the kernel and the basic details you should know about it. Kernel is a computational engine that's in charge of processing code inside Jupyter Notebook. We engage the kernel each and every time we press the run button, and in return, our code is being executed. 
For example, we'd like to know how many fruits we have in total if our number of apples is 20 and our number of watermelons is 5. Once we click on Run or press Shift and Enter on your keyboard, the calculation is happening inside the kernel on a remote server. And once the kernel is done interpreting the code, it returns the information we requested back to our notebook. You can see that along with the results, there's suddenly a number besides the cell, which means that A, the cell was successfully executed, and B, this particular cell was the first to run since we started communicating with the kernel. In cases where we don't include a print statement, the kernel will store the information so we can access it in the following cells. For example, in the first cell, I've filled in some information about my name, city, and occupation. And once I run it, you can see that I don't really get anything in return. However, I am still able to access this information in the following cell, even though I've defined it elsewhere. Now, in times like these, it's important to have a backup plan. So let's maybe change my occupation to something a bit more post-apocalyptic, like, I don't know, goat farming or lumberjacking. Let's see what happens if we do not notify the kernel that we've made a change and skip running the cell. Will my print statement still be updated in a cell below? And nope, if we do not engage the kernel, it's simply not aware of the change we've just made. We'll need to run the cell we've updated and then rerun our print statement. And yep, looks like I'm gonna be a very useful individual after the plague, you'll see. Now let's talk about these three mysterious buttons and experiment with them essentially. I'll use the help of this very long loop so we have enough time to catch the kernel in action. Otherwise, it runs too fast for me to interrupt. So let's run the cell and I want you guys to notice two things that happen while the cell is being processed. The previously white circle on the top right of your notebook will now turn black. And also an asterisk will appear beside your cell as it didn't finish running yet because it's still dealing with my loop. Now once we click on the interrupt kernel square button, we are stopping this particular cell from running. And even though there's a number besides it now, if we scroll all the way down to see the results of our print statement, we see that a keyboard interrupt error occurred and that our loop was interrupted before it reached the last value, which was supposed to be a million. Now, how about the restart kernel button, the one with the circular arrow? We'll click on it and confirm with restart. And once we see the kernel ready message, we notice that nothing really happened, while restart usually means a clean slate. Let's try to access one of the values from our previous cells. I wanna see if the notebook still remembers my name. We'll print my underscore name and nope, not only it doesn't access the values we've previously defined, we can also see that this cell is now appears as the first to run. So when you restart your kernel, Jupyter forgets all the information it gathered up to this point, and you'll have to run everything from scratch. Lucky for us, Jupyter actually has a button especially for that. This would be the restart kernel and rerun all cells button and it will make your life so much easier in these cases. I'm just gonna make my loop a little bit shorter so it doesn't take me a lifetime to run. Let's click it. We'll confirm once again. And as you can see, as a result, all the cells in this notebook were processed one by one in a sequence. In terms of saving, you can either rely on Jupyter's autosave option or you can simply click on the save button. You can also download and convert the notebook into various file formats, where the most common would be .ipynb, which is also used by Google Colab. Speaking of Google Colab, let's see if it's any different. We'll open our Google Drive in a browser and navigate to the correct folder. We'll click on new, select more, and then Google Collaboratory. But if you guys don't see that option, click on Connect More Apps instead. Uh, so let's start a new collaboratory file. Now, Collab also combines between code cells and text cells, and it's 
essentially a younger, prettier sibling of Jupiter, at least from my point of view. And just like Jupiter, we can either click on run the cell or we can press shift enter to execute. In terms of design, Colab has some really cool styling tools for your tech cells. And it also shows you a preview, so you don't have to run the cell each time you adjust your font thickness or something. You can combine as many headings, paragraphs, images, and links as you want. You can also add code boxes, lists, and even separators. They thought of everything. Um, your images here, however, must already be online if you want to use them. You don't really get access to your computer's image library, unfortunately, but we're not going to complain about it. In terms of kernel buttons, in Colab they'll be called runtime buttons and you can easily access them from the drop-down menu and they'll essentially do the same. In Google Colab, however, you'll have the ability to connect to Google's powerful GPU and you'll get to do it for free. But we are far from the point we'll need such power, so don't leave it on. Um, I will not leave it on either. Another cool Colab advantage is the ability to add comments and share your code with anybody in the world. So if you guys are planning to learn as a group, I highly recommend using only Colab for that, just because of that feature. And to be honest, the only downside I found in Colab is the inability to access the files on your computer. So yes, they solved it by allowing you to connect to your Google Drive, but it's not as convenient because you still got to go through this entire process just to get access. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. If you have any questions, please make sure to comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and check out lesson number three, where, believe it or not, we're actually going to study some Python.